So tonight, uh, looks like we got Bruce in the chat. Welcome, Bruce. Glad to have you. I don't know if you're going to hear me because this is my web phone uh, microphone. It's pretty crap. Oh, we hear you just fine, sir. All right. So uh, this evening, uh, first off, I'd like to start off by saying thank you for being here. Um, second, um, through some kind of internal discussion, uh, we're going to be moving these a little further apart. Um, And did we lose Josh? Josh, shall we get started? <laughs> Boy, I guess they are it's, a bit uh, further apart. Yet, but... <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not hearing Josh there. Am I coming through? Everybody hear me? Now I can I hear you. Guess. Okay. Dave, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Um, guess Discord's Bruce? having some hey, trouble Bruce. tonight. Yeah, Bruce chimed in a minute ago. Yep. Nice. Um, all right, so I'm going to start over. Uh, first off, thank you for being here. Second, uh, we're going to be spacing Damn, these. Is it just me, or did it all get quiet? I think you're having trouble, Dave. <laughs> All right, so, um, like I was saying, we're going to be moving these a little further apart, maybe uh, once a m once a month or, or two times a month instead of every week, um, just so we can. What we're looking to do is kind of build our attendance a little bit, and I think by moving them a little further apart, uh, we're going to be able to kind of increase that and get a little bit more community feedback. Um, also, if there's a better time that works for you guys, uh, let us know. Um, and you can just drop it in the chat. Uh, we're trying to gauge everybody's kind of time. It's, it's kind of hard to hit everybody all at once across the entire United States. And, and we do get some people from time to time that jump in from overseas and, uh, we want to be able to accommodate as many people as we can. So, um, on that note, um, tonight's discussion is going to be on app development and what specifically you guys uh, would be looking for in terms of a uh, mobile app that would kind of supplement your recreational flying. And um, to kind of kick that off, uh, when you think of apps like uh, Before You Fly, if you've used those, or Air Map, or Kitty Hawk, um, how have those worked for you and kind of what would you like to see different? And um, again, I will preface it by saying that, you know, this is all in theory at this point. Um, it's kind of on our radar to do something like this, but it's not an immediate project. But having some feedback early on is definitely a good thing. So um, at any rate, so who here has used Before You Fly? I have. Okay. What were your thoughts on that, Dean? Uh, honestly, uh, for me, it works fine. It, it's easy to use, and it gives me the information I need in terms of whether I'm in a legal spot to fly or not. Okay. And no issues with usability? Are there features missing that you would like to um, see in there or anything like that? In a perfect world, it would be great to have an app that told you, you know, both location restrictions and gave you uh, weather as at the same in the same app. Because okay, those are the two things I check. Okay, very good. All right. What I is think... it about the weather that you're most interested in? Um, uh, really, just um, uh. Thunderstorm activity and uh, wind speed. Wind speed is probably the biggest thing. 
Uh, For me, I don't like to fly in a lot of wind. Sure. Tired Flyer, if you're listening, could you mute yourself while you're not talking? Thanks. Oh, sorry. (laughs) We can hear you building or cooking or something. (laughs) Yes, I'll I'll tell you. All right, so weather and location. So a couple of the ideas that I had uh, would be obviously similar to to, um, Before You Fly or Air Map. Is it, is it just you be able or... to distinct? Oh, okay. One of the biggest things. Well, you kind of dropped there for a second. I couldn't tell if it was me or. Yeah, we're really okay. struggling with Discord tonight. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. Uh, it might be me. Hang on one second, guys. Let me see if I can fix this. Let me guess. He's uploading a gigantic video to YouTube or something and killing his bandwidth. <laughs> Pornhub. <laughs> Is there a point in reinventing the wheel? Like you've got the, you know, all the apps that are there now. I'd have thought a good app would be something like a, a um, an app that connects everyone together. You want to go flying, and then everyone else gets advised, and you can organise flying in advance or just um, coordinate activities rather than reinvent the wheel with the, you know, can I fly here? What's the weather like? All that sort of stuff. Just a thought. Yeah, one thing I was thinking I'm sorry. of, too. I'm sorry, Bruce, I missed it. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt oh, you. Uh, to reiterate, uh, Bruce was saying instead of reinventing the wheel on uh, you know, where you can fly and so on and so forth, um, maybe something more for organization uh, and getting together, if I, if I heard that correctly. Uh, he'll have to chime back in to uh, correct me, but... One thing I was thinking of is uh, um, it'd be nice to be able to have uh, like a nice app with uh, photos of registrations, uh, part 107, any other authorization, so on and so forth, or um, and even just quick checklists, whatnot, in case you are dealing with authorities quick access to the FPV FC safety guidelines falls under what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. But then also, instead of physically carrying uh, regist- you know, uh, paper cards or, or whatnot, <clears throat> have it all available in an app. Okay. Way to digitize your certifications and, and registrations, basically. Sure, yeah. I don't know if that's okay. feasible, or at least a copy, but, you know, just having a, no, everything it at the ready if, you're, if you ever have to deal with the authorities. I'd say we're not looking for feasible right now. We're just brainstorming ideas. <laughs> sure, sure. Certifications and registration. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I, I've noticed is a huge difference between like before you fly an air map or before you fly in Kitty Hawk. Yep, and we lost we lost Josh again. Yeah, he's out. Yeah, it kind of dropped halfway through talking there. The one that says you can yeah. fly. The last thing but, I heard Josh uh, say was the difference between Kitty Hawk and Before You Fly, and then it cut out. Okay, I'm going to drop out and come right and, back. Okay, we're hearing that Please. part just fine. It's gonna, this is going to be like the George Carlin <laughs> routine. When he when he couldn't pronounce someone's name, he'd say, uh, and we have uh, Joshua... Uh, do you, do, 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 Yep, and uh, now uh, you know, would uh, like to bring them to you. Either that, or the and the passphrase is. <laughs> <laughs> is that what I sound like right now? <laughs> no, it just goes silent. Oh, Every geez. time you're saying something not so important, it sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> And then now he's probably trying to talk, and it's it's totally gone again. Can't hear him. That's that's going to make this meeting really difficult. Okay, so... And now he's back. Hang on a second. Dave can... The typing's coming across great. 
can hear his keyboard fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's that, uh, it's that um, uh, steel spring uh, keyboard from the yeah. 80s. <sighs> okay, um, uh, so where we, where we were was uh, looking for an app that uh, might do something uh, like Meetup, and uh, Bruce's idea, I think, is uh, uh, one that's... Uh, uh, germane for all of these discussions, which is uh, uh, there is there, you know there are a million iPhone apps, and uh, you know, so finding and utilizing something that already exists and uh, either co-opting it or uh, integrating it uh, to me is uh, viable. So uh, my uh, son has described to me uh, a an app that has now become passe for the uh, millennials. Uh, but uh, Meetup was an app. Uh, certainly, we could utilize that to uh, describe um, that when we're getting together, uh, we have an event, and uh, certainly where where I am, that would be uh, a a great thing because uh, uh, we've got uh, very very few people uh, flying in a pretty diverse area in upstate New York. Uh, how about putting the word, uh, putting out the word? Looking, yeah, yeah. Who's interested? Yeah, who? And this is a uh, yeah. And motorcycle groups are, uh, do this uh, regularly. Yeah, where I got the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a thought. Uh, yeah, I think we're finding a, a high uh, high overlap in uh, motorcycling and uh, 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 FPV. Other uh, other aspects of uh, what we'd want to. Uh, see uh, in an app that would be of some value. So I've got uh, downloaded uh, certs and documents, um, utilizing and leveraging some of what's uh, or some uh, some way to uh, 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 to uh, utilize the capabilities that we see that are use very useful in before you fly location and weather. One of the ones that I've not heard that uh, certainly we're working on is uh, insurance. And uh, uh, so there are apps uh, like uh, Verifly, who's a, a broker, Skywatch, who is a uh, another broker. Uh, and uh, they can uh, offer insurance on uh, an hourly, daily, mo or monthly basis. Um, from what we're seeing and uh, learning more about insurance than we ever really wanted to know. Uh, at least in the United States, we know that uh, uh, there's been a change as of, uh, of, as of about 2015 uh, in the uh, ISO Insurance Service Office, which is a, an underwriter for all but the very largest uh, insurance companies that has excluded UASs from homeowners insurance. So uh, if you're uh, flying um a a drone anywhere it's uh a, and it's uh, uh not a uh, a site that you you're comfortable that uh, you are flying safely um uh, if there's any risk it's something to be thinking about so is is that an uh an aspect of an app that um could be of value yeah i would think so all right especially if you you know have to upload pictures or whatever online claim. I mean, mm -hmm. however rare it is. Yep, but still handy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, kind of jumping back in. Everybody, hear me now. Able to tag sites on like Google Maps. So if you're looking for somebody to fly, you're in an area you don't usually fly on. You can see sites that other people have flown, perhaps with a few comments or notes as to any problems or, or whatever, or regular meets there that might be a way of increasing the social engagement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I Thanks. personally uh, have been uh, sort of creating a digital map of my own work, uh, my own my own areas I've flown. Uh, on Google, I think Google Drive. Now, one of the ideas that I had was um, a... Uh, flight logging system um, similar to uh, not so much like uh, connecting right, to yeah. your multi rotor or anything like that, but just inputting basic information, kind of like what, what Bruce was saying, uh, kind of 
where you were, what happened, how long you flew, how many packs, were there any issues with the public, were there any issues with law enforcement, was there, you know, an accident, kind of self-identifying, so it gives um, us a database uh, for, eh, okay, I give up tonight. <laughs> I can hear you, Josh. It yeah, seems fine. Hear you. I don't know what happened okay. with Bruce. Five, five, five. Not, not sure if uh, you can hear us. So. <laughs> yeah, it hear sounded you. like you started talking over one of the other people like you couldn't hear them. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, so, uh, at any rate, um, a way of, you know, gathering data so that we can use that data to come to regulators with. Does that make sense? Uh, if something like that existed, would you be willing to input that data on a, and it doesn't have to be at the time you're flying. It could be post kind of like a, a, a pre-flight post-flight, you know, uh, document that you could voluntarily submit and give us some, you know, some hard data on what happened during your flying. That definitely feeds into some of the stuff Bruce has talked about on his YouTube channel lately about the insurance companies obviously know that flying drones are safe because they're dropping the, the rates and things like that. So mm -hmm. they, they have some data that says that it's, you know, it's not that dangerous. It doesn't cost them a lot in insurance. So maybe if people collected yeah. more information, that would lead into that and make it even better. But, you know, people have to volunteer that information. Okay. Yeah, um... no, Go ahead. I've done some, uh, had some media, done some media contacting because I ran across some articles that were, um, you know, just pointing out the odd accident that happens here and there or the, you know, the infamous, I saw a drone at the end of my runway kind of thing. Good thing I wasn't on final. Um, and uh, um, so I contacted the, um, contacted the people who wrote the article and said, you know, do you know how many safe flights that occur every day that you seem to miss in your article? You know, was the gist of it? Be great to have some hard data you could throw at them and say, you know, uh, yeah, there was one accident, but there was during that same time period, there was also, you know, 3,000 safe flights. Right. Know. Well, we've got 1.25 million uh, recreational uh, drones uh, operating in the United States today, per the FAA. So, you know, yeah. given the given the uh, you know the frequency with which they might fly, that's a lot of flights in uh, in, in every you know, happening every day. Uh, so, you know, looking at that, you know, we're not seeing a lot of accidents. No, uh, we aren't. And... I'm, I'm with I'm with you completely. I mean, that's I'm a, a champion of uh, additional data. Uh, I think it, we might want it um, anonymous. I was thinking about um, you know, the, the, uh, before, you know, as we uh, work to improve the uh, reputation of uh, uh, drones and drone pilots. I, I certainly, I will. I think we want to protect the uh, identity of a of a drone pilot. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you know, we don't want them uh, stalked or uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, vilified you know, publicly. Yeah, you'd have to make a very attractive offer or offer something else to, for it to not be anonymous. Uh, most people mm -hmm. would prefer it to mm -hmm. be anonymous, but if there was some really big reason not to, maybe some people would be willing yep. to go that route. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any real reason that we would need specific who the pilot was or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about, you know, submitting, you know, accurate data on uh, what type of flight took place and, you know, what were the circumstances surrounding it, you know. And, sure. you know, beyond that, it doesn't matter who flew it, what you were flying, you know, or anything like that. Um, just you know, hard data that, hey, you had a safe flight, or hey, I had a little bit of an incident with the public, you know, that kind of information goes a long way to saying, you know, where, not only, you know, that we're flying safe, but what parts of the country may have an issue with it, you mm -hmm. know, or, yeah. or, I mean, because we all know different parts of the country believe in much, uh, very different things. Yep. And um, a lot of, 
you know, parts of the country are very clannish and protect their privacy. Other parts are very wide open <coughs> and don't and have no expectation of it. You mm-hmm. know, so, um, you know, it, it yeah. kind of would start to build a map of, of the country. Yeah, under the heading so of utilizing uh, an existing app, there is a, uh, a popular app in, the, in my neck of the woods, uh, which is a hunting application, which is a link to the GPS in your phone, and you can uh, drop pins on your location where you have uh, put uh, cameras out in uh, in the woods to uh, to spot animals and spot paths. This is it's legal since we're not, you're not um, uh, you know, jacking uh, or doing anything uh, malicious. You're just watching uh, through the night, and so it, it, the app uh, is simply oh I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at a satellite image of where I'm standing, and yes, you know uh, put you know make a point here and uh, give me a little and it opens up a window for a couple of lines of notes and you're done. And so it's a uh, you know there as a nice existing application that uh, could fit uh, nicely for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, up in Wisconsin and Minnesota, we have Lake Link. And you can do the same thing, uh, your coordinates for, you know, where you, you where you found the crappies or, hey, you know, mm-hmm. I got uh, right along this ridge line, I've got, uh, I got a 50 inch muskie or whatever. <laughs> now, they may be propied, proprietary, so it, it, you know it may not be something that we could piggyback on, but it something like that does exist out there. So. Yeah, I'm really all, surprised I'm people are willing to share some of that information. I know, right? <laughs> and, and I, think, I think there was a post on Rotorite the other day about that specific thing. Somebody asked, you know, what about an app to track places down, you know, that are good for for flying? And some people posted on there like. Those are my spots. I don't want them flooded by everybody else. Yeah. You know, I don't. And some people I, are protective of that kind of information. Oh yeah, where where I yeah, put true. the sunken cribs, I certainly don't share that data. <laughs> <laughs> Around me, I like to go find some new spots, make a video, and then have my friends ask me, "Oh, where was that spot?" Yeah, and there's not too many people around here, so it's it's fine sharing it. But I want to find it first, and then have them ask yeah. me about it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've come across, you know, Phoenix is very wide open, spread out, and, you know, depending on the, the time of day or, or you know, the day itself, there's some places that are good, some places that are bad. There's, you know, a couple uh, office parks that me and my friends would go to where um, security security was totally cool. You know, they'd stop by, we'd show them the goggles and, and let them watch us, and they say, you know what, have fun, just don't damage anything, you know? And we were, you know, it'd be good to be able to drop a pin and say, hey, you know, we're, we're good to fly here on the weekends when nobody's here, you know. Um, but, you know, in other, other parts, it's like, okay, it'd be nice to be able to uh, flag, you know, parks or, you know, open spaces or abandoned buildings and basically say good to go, not good to go, you know. Um, and in Arizona, in one regard, we're kind of lucky because Arizona state law has – basically said cities can't make separate regulations in regards to UAS. So, but at the same time, they required every city in Arizona to designate at least one park. Now, Phoenix is made up of literally 30 different cities. So each one of those cities have designated one park capable of supporting model aircraft. Cool. And, um, you know, it'd be nice to be able to pinpoint those for people who are coming into the hobby, you know, and may not know where all those locations are. Wait, Josh, uh, where did okay. you find these? So is there anything uh, in an app that um, would have a value that's more uh, the mechanical, the, you know, and so I'm thinking of things like Speedy B. I'm thinking of uh, if it's a log on batteries or if it's some diagnosis capability or, it's um, pulling in arm codes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my fave. <laughs> Wait, Josh, I didn't get that. Um, <laughs> I think no, I mean... uh, for me personally, uh, what I kind of put in my notes was a uh, model build record system. So, kind of, uh, um, 
you know, usually when I go out, I take like four or five quads and um, nice to have backups. But, um, you know, a place to be able to put notes in there and say, you know, this one had an issue with an ESC or burnt the motor out on this one or, you know, need to retune this one, something like that. Um, would that be useful to anybody? Yeah. Would to me. Okay. I, I think it would be to uh, Josh. I think we're, I just wanted to point out, I, I know Tired Flyer is trying to get some information from you on uh, uh, where those park locations are. And I just okay. noticed there's a, there's a lot of stepping on people going on. And I think we're having, I'm not pointing out a problem with anybody. I'm just saying that I think we're having technical issues tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not meaning to step on anybody. I apologize. <laughs> um if that's me uh and it probably is so uh apologize apologies i'm not i'm not getting people's feeds apparently yeah i i did see on i did see on the air maps that there were some areas that uh he's still showing had, had to me up on it but uh oh there we yeah. go tired flyer i can hear you now sorry dude oh Would you would will... you start would you start again? You were saying that you tired flyer. You you were starting to say that you saw something somewhere. Yeah, I I saw that on the air map there there were some green green bubbles around here and there, and I think those are the parks, but I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, I believe I don't think uh, air maps calls out the parks. I'd have to re-download it and check it out. Um. I believe the green bubbles are signifying uh, helipads and uh, small little regional airports. So yeah, because it said something about uh, some AMA uh, AMA certified uh, model model flyer area or something. Okay, okay. Um, they might have those marked out. Let me re-download that, and I will check that out. Those will actually show up as airports because they, they, they actually do on the, on, the, on the FAA charts as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because there's one not too far from me there. It's, it's a non-drone-friendly non uh, um, place, but it, um, they show up as a, you know, like a, the same way uh, like a private airstrip does. Mm-hmm. And Josh, there's a, an app that uh, I don't know if they've, you found it called RC Flight and Battery Log, which will and so uh, I'm I'm I downloaded it. I thought it'd be interesting, but it it's uh, sufficiently painful that I have not uh, utilized it because I've <laughs> not gotten into the habit of uh, keying in uh, uh, logs after uh, ev every flight. But that's exactly uh, you know what it does, and it. Uh, it's got a lot of information on all of your batteries. So, so uh, uh, like I say, I'm not there yet. Uh, you know, I'm approaching that uh, that stage where I, I might have enough time to uh, to log all of my lipos. But <laughs> it, it, it would be it, it would be kind of nice if Betaflight had a minimal logging option where it would just log time of flight, and maybe you could. Through the user interface, you could set what your battery number is, or a few other things, and mm -hmm. so that your memory card wouldn't fill so up instantly. Goes. Well, that that can all be put in OSD for the most part. Um, not not which battery you're using, but um, yeah, I don't know. There, I think there is some customization with the OSD. So, just think it would be fun to. I don't know, fly for a whole month, have it all recorded on the internal memory card of your flight controller, then download it to your computer and have that entire log of a month's worth of flying handy. And you didn't have to do anything. It's just automatically logged for you. I believe Red Cat's doing something about that. Yeah, I think you're right that in some of those interviews with Red Cat, they talked about trying to do some of that and encrypting it and storing it in the blockchain and whatnot. Haven't heard much from them lately, but... Maybe they'll keep working on that. Did we lose everybody else?
No, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I was uh, looking at these green bubbles all over my map. Uh, tired, I'm going to have to get back to you on the green bubbles and air map. Um, a couple of them look like they might be AMA fields that have put notifications in that there's currently people flying. Um, but I will have to double check that and figure that out because it's not readily apparent in the app what they are. Yeah, because uh, our we have a drone club in our uh, our college campus, and uh, I think uh, who's it again? The club president has just been using that to identify just field supply, in, I guess so. Yeah. All right. Um, where, where are you seeing those green bubbles? Huh? Any well, it, <laughs> well, pull up Phoenix, and you'll you'll see them. There's. Oh, I got you. Yeah, we're we're congested out here. So there's uh the big blue ones are sig uh sig signifying the uh airports um and then there's orange ones around those signifying uh areas that are um not to be used. Um uh, they're the 5 mile 5 mile radius and then like if you look at Sky Harbor, it's got a big bow tie around it and those are the uh, approach and takeoff uh, areas. I'm a bit confused about the approach and takeoff areas, to be honest. Uh, because if I'm correct, before you fly, it shows a five mile radius, but uh, air maps shows the bow time. Yeah, um, I don't know that. Again, it it kind of comes back to the differences between one app versus another. Um, where one will show the the bow tie, and that was recently changed here in Phoenix, uh, probably about six months ago, eight months ago, where they changed that pattern in terms of the uh, spatial maps due to UAS and whatnot. So um, apparently, the five mile bubble wasn't doing it enough, and or doing enough for them. So they went ahead and extended that out on there to kind of mitigate some of that. So um, I don't know why Before You Fly doesn't show it, uh, but yeah. I, I did a, uh, uh, or participated in a uh, FAA uh, discussion on uh, Facebook, uh, I don't remember when, week and a half, two weeks ago, and it was about airspace and one of the things that, uh, that they talked about was having some of those bow tied areas to protect the approaches in uh, at some of the uh, the larger controlled airspaces. Yeah, some of the bigger airports, the yeah. more traffic, yeah, yeah, higher traffic. So, yeah. so they're you know, wanting to clear. They're wanting to clear clear those approach areas a little bit. Okay. Um. But yeah, I mean, just in Phoenix alone, uh, in the greater Phoenix area, um, we've got, just near me, I've got two separate. I've got Glendale Airport, I've got uh, Goodyear Airport, and I have Luke Air Force Base. So, um, let's see. Your mic is, or your headphones are off. Let's <laughs> see. Headphones are off. Okay. Um, all right. So, Dave, going back to what you were saying um, cool. about, like, maybe uh, some way of incorporating – were you thinking, like, like incorporating, like, a beta flight configurator or, or cool. something like that? Is that kind of where you were going? Hey, hey real quick. Yeah. Sorry to go back to air map, but I just looked it up. Uh, the blue circles are – representing class B airspace. Okay. And the green? Um, well, I don't know. I didn't get that far down in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I take that back. Green is class B, blue is class D. Okay. I just did a Google search for, you know, colors and air map and they have a little thing there, but anyway. Back to your regular schedule. Okay, so looks like another. I did another Google search on airmap.com. It says green areas. You're encouraged to fly in these designated areas. 
So, um, which is kind of funny because one of those designated areas overlaps with Goodyear Airport. So, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Go air map, right? Uh, so let's see small inconsistencies like this that I, me personally, I would be looking to avoid. You know, I would never recommend an area within a five mile radius of an airport. You know, especially with without saying you need to contact either use Lance or contact the air traffic control tower. So. Just saying on that part. So going back to what you were talking about, Dave. Completely gone. That's okay. Um, <laughs> you were talking. Let me refresh your memory. That's why I'm here. Oh, I got. I got it. Uh, it's good. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Senior moment. Alzheimer's averted. Alzheimer's averted. Back quick. <laughs> oh, gee. Yeah. Enough caffeine today. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, if not something like beta flight, something uh, along the lines for a newcomer. And uh, you know, if it's uh, you know, why won't this thing arm again? Or what's my uh, if if not a, a startup checklist, or something to help on the on the mechanical side? Is there something? Um, I find that I'm not carrying anything out to the field. I'm not carrying uh, a laptop. I don't carry. Uh, a phone. I mean, I ha always have my phone, but I don't carry uh, a SpeedyB uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, connection with me. And do, do other guys, you know, find that they need something? Are they, you know, I, I've got access through um, on-screen display or uh, with Lua scripts um, that I can uh, tune the device sufficiently. But yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I, I skew toward the the geek side, and I've been doing this for a little bit, enough to uh, almost be dangerous. Uh, is there something that would be helpful to uh, a newcomer that would be more of the you know, help uh, help on the technology side? Well, I don't know. That's more of a uh, at the bench kind of thing, I think. But yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back at the uh, back where you're where you're building. About yeah. the Horn Hunter thing about help on te technology side, I think uh, the Horn Hunter meetup idea was a really good idea to solve that problem because it uh -huh. helps link uh, link people together. Okay. You're familiar uh, with the app then? Uh, no, I'm I'm just saying like uh, I found that a lot of newcomers to come come to me to go go get help on the first build or want to watch me do a build or something like that. Honestly, it's it helps them a lot. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So more of a partnership. Get you know flying with people. So, I think Good. what Dave's kind of kind of pointing out is is newcomers. They don't oftentimes have they haven't made those connections yet. Um. But I like so, I like the idea instead of you know a yeah. uh, a how to and something technical. It's like no, you know, come, you know, hang out with us. You know, just want you know absolutely. Enjoy. And I like the, that as an introduction. I think that's a great thought. Okay. If cool. we look at if we look at stuff like uh, like you know like amateur radio, I know we referred to that a number of times, and we've got a number of operators here. But um, you know, I mean, I had somebody with me when I you know hooked up my first radio and antennas and all that stuff. I was fortunate to have family members that could help with that. But um, you know, I really think if you're if you're wiring up that first quad, it's really, um, you know, a safety, you know, safety wise and, uh, and, um, yeah, I would love to have been able to talk to someone. I, I yeah, yeah did, that one, did that, did that one alone. Yep. Yeah, me too. And, and, uh, you know, I don't, I, I was glad I didn't have props on, but you know, I mean, that thing would have been <laughs> flopping all over cause I had it screwed up, you know, cause I didn't know what I was doing. So. Yep. I think this is something we mentioned before, but the FPVFC could co help coordinate mentors and mentees, uh, get people together to help each other. Absolutely. Like, uh, maybe that could be a functionality in the app is, you know, say, hey, you know, people can sign up to be a mentor and people can kind of tap those people via the app to um, get some help. Well, Even if you we... know, to make it really easy, you can just um, have the app 
log you right into Discord, and that's where your mentors are. Yeah. Or even a, a listing on the uh, on the website. You know, you could sign up to be a mentor in this, you know, in the area that you live, and then people could, you know, there'd be a contact way for them to get some contact information for you and then get a hold of you and, you know, coordinate. Hey, let's, you know, if I can help you sit down and get your first build done or get your beta flight. You know, you get it built and I'll go through it with you, you know. Uh, and we'll make sure it hovers and all that stuff before you take it out and try to fly it. Okay, here's a here's a different tack. Um, uh, combining uh, game game theory as well as uh, borrowing from ham radio, uh, as well as uh, thinking about uh, races and Aries. Uh, so we've uh, we know the ham radio operators have a uh, Usually once a year, they, there's a national event where folks get together and they try to locate a hidden transmitter uh, somewhere in in a field. And um, you know, I'm I'm delighted that people uh, do that and uh, and uh, enjoy doing that. There's a there's a you know uh, there's good utility to you know to figure out triangulation. And so you know it's you know it's not you know you know, there is a, a purpose behind figuring that out. But I was thinking we had a great discussion a couple of weeks ago about working in, with emergency responders is if there is uh, you know, making, you know, preparation and a game out of, you know, we want to, you know, we're going to simulate an emergency and, uh, you know, we want uh, folks to, you know, take you know, specific tasks. Now, this may be too structured, but my thought is, okay, you know, if it's not a competition, if it's not a race, maybe there's something that could be of interest uh, to freestyle pilots that has uh, utility as well as getting people together and uh, from the social aspect of it. I kind of see where you're going with that, kind of like a impromptu training or uh, kind of like a geocache training system or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I kinda mean, like in, in the area I'm, I'm in for, um, for years, it's kind of dropped off now, but we used to have pretty, um, pretty regular, regular get togethers. If people just wanted to, you know, get together before a club meeting or something like that. And, um, you know, whatever it was, help study for an exam, go over equipment, answer questions, whatever. We did that. Uh, and um, I think you were talking about uh, field day, Dave, and that's actually not, that's actually, you're close, but it's not what it is. It's, it's uh, clubs. I think you have to have a minimum of three operators together. You register with the ARRL, and then it's um, how many contacts can you make uh, from a remote location? Um, so the club, I, uh, the club I'm in, um, we go to a park, you string up antennas, set up different numbers of stations on different bands, different types, all that kind of stuff, and then it's how many contacts can you make in that two day period? And uh, so it's usually, you know, usually over a weekend to facilitate things. Um, and it's, you know, it's um, we used to get the media out there. It was a great public exposure to amateur radio. People were invited out. They could sit down, make contacts um, because they're under supervision of a licensed operator, which makes it legal. Um, so, you know, you got some 10 year old kid and they're now talking to somebody in Japan over a radio, which, you know, when you're eight years old is pretty cool. Agreed. Or at least used to be before the internet, you know? Right. Yeah. So. Well, no, it's, yeah, it's still, it, it's still pretty awesome. Um, it, it is yeah, to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah a bunch of glowing same. tubes and I can talk to Japan, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. But that's that. Yeah. The, the, there are two, two types of events, uh, you know, a R R L type events. One is exactly as you're describing. And the other was, uh, you know, the more the treasure hunt, and yeah. either one, I mean, that's that's the uh, the essence of the uh, idea of getting people together 
you know, it, not not having a uh, a a competition that creates animosity, but one that's uh, the competition is secondary to you know learning, enjoying, and being with uh, people with like interests. Yeah, absolutely. The the barbecue and the social aspect is a big part of it, and just being able to meet somebody who you know, can become a mentor and a teacher and, you know, all those kinds of things, what, mm -hmm. you know, is, is really the biggest part of it. I think that's mm -hmm. a, I think that's a great way uh, to expand our, uh, our image, our, uh, our exposure, our footprint in the community in terms of, uh, hey, we're here, look at the number of safe flights we have, look at the social aspect of what we're doing the health issues, mm -hmm. all the, you know, all of the things that we've talked about. If you look at our list of purposes on the website, all of those things fall under that kind of activity, you know, yeah. all yep. of those things that, that just makes us, uh, makes us who we are and shows who we are, you know, as a group of people. Yeah. Like a, like a mini rampage with, uh, uh, with an agenda. It's, it's exactly that. It's exactly <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Big gathering of like-minded people, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay. I'm trying to think. What uh, else? A... No, go ahead, bud. <coughs> uh, just a thought. Uh, how do you use the la the the land system? So Lance, the Lance system right now is not geared towards hobbyists yet um they're they're not ready for that so right now you use the land system through something like air map um or through kitty hawk um and that's a system where you basically pre-plan your flight um and by doing so you're requesting authorization to fly in that specific area and the the only time you need to to use that is if you're uh, f looking to exceed um, the altitude limit or the um, radius around an airport. Um, basically, come within that bubble. Um, but general, right now, it's only geared for the commercial side of the industry. Um, the entire system is up. It's just not geared for the hobbyists yet. So I'm pretty sure if uh, I understand that right, like you have to put in your part 107 ID number or something into the app and it shares that with the airport, right? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. And um, not only that, um, it's a the nice thing is it's a go no go situation where they're going to respond to you immediately. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's geared more for that. Um, it, it's going to be your real estate pilots your film you know film industry pilots your ag pilots um all those type of folks are the ones that are going to be using lance at this moment it is coming for obvious so they say uh it just hasn't rolled out yet yeah i honestly think that this would be really nice especially as a hobbyist who happens to live inside the uh no fly area mm -hmm. but yeah um i just want to say that like at least i think in an app, they should at least put put a way to just contact the airport because uh, it took me a while to find out how to any of the airports. So yeah, yeah, it does. Sometimes it does take some time um, to locate that information. Sometimes you're lucky. Uh, I know, like up in Sedona, they put the phone number right there on the sign. So, um, what are your guys' experiences with contacting the airports? How do they react? Oh, you, you want to hear the you want to hear the nightmare story of this? <laughs> Sure. So <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> so so if I pop into right, so I get my you know get my first aircraft built, and uh, I you know I I do my due diligence and pop into before before you fly, and it says you live within five miles of three airports, and uh, you can't you know basically you can't fly. Warning, warning, danger. You know. And uh, I'm like, five miles to three airports? No, Hartford is, you know, further than five miles north from me. So long story short, I never make long story short. But anyway, uh, 
there's three private uh, pl private fields close to me. One of them turns out to be this uh, this um, uh, model aircraft club. Okay, so that one. All right, I find out that's what that is. Then there's two private airstrips. One of which is a guy I know down the road from me, and I never knew he had it. Um, but he's listed, and so as long as they're listed, you have to contact. No phone number, uh, and I don't know it's my. I don't know it's a guy I know until I go on whatever the FA, whatever the app is to look up airport data, and I see the name, and I go, oh, I think I know who that is, and make contact. The other one, to this day. I have never been able to get the FAA to actually admit that this place is the land was sold to the state of Wisconsin and is a is a uh, a state park. There is no airfield operating at that location, yet it continues to show up on every app that there is. And. Uh, I actually, through much due, due diligence, I actually tracked down the guy who used to own it through his pilot's license and talked to him on the phone finally last week. And he's like, yeah, um, my dad and I sold that property 30 years ago to the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, I don't know why you're contacting me, but we haven't owned it and there's no... We haven't operated in a, a private strip there for 30 years. So there's the answer. Imagine being in that spot. You know, you, you wouldn't be able to fly, right? I mean, because you can't contact the field to get permission. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a little bit uh, strange. <laughs> and, and having written all of that out, Having written all of that out and sent it to the FAA twice now, I have never gotten a reply from them. Well, I mean, there, there's – I'm not going to say that the uh, FAA is the best at responding to people. Uh, you got to keep in mind that they've got a lot of different stuff. Um they do they do differentiate between yes bruce they do differentiate between controlled and uncontrolled however uh, at the same time when you pull up something on before you fly all airports whether it's a helipad or uh, a, a regional airport or a you know grand scale airport they all show up on that. and um, you, you're still required to contact them yeah and so, like, if I were to step out my door right now, I live uh, up against the mountains and then nothing around me but farm fields for the most part and other houses. Um, it classifies the hospital that's, you know, four and a half miles down the street, uh, their helipad as an airport. And right. they put a five-mile exclusion zone around it. So... You know, it's it, it is kind of hit and miss with that kind of stuff. I mean, my experiences with contacting airports have been all been fine, uh, whether it was Sky Harbor or Sedona Regional or um, anything like that. I've never had a problem, but there was a model club uh, here. Uh, I don't know if they're even around. I only flew with them a couple of times, the Gilbert Quiet Flyers, and they had a field that was given to them by the city of Gilbert um, to fly their planes at. They installed a runway, um, the softscape runways and, and whatnot. And Chandler airport was constantly giving them grief because we would call every time we would go to take a flight or they would call and um, started giving them grief. And eventually uh, Chandler Airport basically told the city to reclaim the property because they didn't want to deal with it anymore. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I have had good experience anytime I've been able to contact anyone, mm -hmm. but it's it's this it was this impossible to contact one that is just like, you know, ridiculous to me yeah. that. Um, 
obviously they had not updated uh, or checked on this in just shy of forever. Um, yet, you know, it's still a requirement. You know, um, you would think that periodically they would send out a letter that says, you know, are you still operating? Are you still at this location? Uh, what's your current contact information? Um, you know, but obviously that hasn't been done in 30 years, according to the guy who sold the property. And I know it's been owned by the state since then, because that's that was my argument the first time I looked at, you know, I looked at Google Maps, a satellite image, and I'm like, okay, that GPS location is in the state park. That, there's no airfield there, you know. Right. I mean, it can't be there. It's overgrown with trees, you know. Yeah, so... Um... You know, I think, honestly, I think a, a, a big tack that would be reasonable to take, and I, I, Bruce, I believe this was your idea on one of our, uh, a comment on one of our videos, is to kind of create a, a an umbrella. Um, if you are flying within, I think you said 100 meters um, of whatever the tallest object is uh, within a hundred meters of your location and you're flying underneath it, then there should be no reason to uh, have to call anybody. Yeah. Um, we have a setup here in New Zealand called shielded operations, which basically it's, it's recognizes that there's no risk. If you're flying under the trees, uh, even right alongside an airfield, there's no risk to aircraft because you're not going to find any aircraft there. So this shielded operation allows us to fly basically anywhere in the country, providing we do not, fly higher than the tallest object, man-made or natural, within 100 metres. And that's a fantastic way because it opens up all these urban and suburban flying sites, even if there's an airfield just down the road. It's just common sense. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, that's something that, that I would really like to push push after. And it would, it would negate all these silly... Um, merry-go-round of calling people and, and making sure it's okay and it would it would put you know it would put the regulators at ease it would put the airfields at ease it would put the model flyer at ease and you know being able to say yeah i can fly here because there's a you know 10-story building right here that i can stay underneath and there's not going to be any air uh air traffic underneath this building so Right, or I'm within. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm at the park that's uh, a block and a half away from the hospital. And if there's any kind of a, a med flight coming in there, I'm going to hear them way before they're anywhere near where I am. You know, and you know, bang, you're down below the trees. I mean, there's some things that just make sense. Uh, yeah. it, you know, the 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 med flight. Uh, uh, National Guard med flight, flight unit that does training and flies out near my house. I can hear them long before I can see them, even in, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, you know, the longest visibility. Yeah, There's no is... way that I'm not going to hear them. You know, yeah, I think one of the things that we need to do is educate regulators because the people making these rules at the FAA and all the other regulators, they have, they're not the people flying models. They don't, under, no. don't understand that when you put on a set of goggles, you don't go deaf. And if there's an <laughs> aircraft close enough to you to be a threat, you can hear it. So it's quite yeah. different to sitting in the cockpit of a Cessna 172. As soon as you start the motor up, you've lost your sense of hearing. You cannot hear another aircraft if it's about to crash into you. And you've got obstructed field of view because you've got a cowl up the front and a floor below you and wings out the side. That's why we have mid-airs between manned aircraft, but we've never had anything in the way of a fatal mid-air between a drone and a manned aircraft. We, had, we need to educate the regulators so they can see that they've got to cut us some slack and that they've just gone overboard. But we have to do it with facts and obvious um, you know, representations that are based on the reality of the situation. Until we do that, we're always going to play second tier. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, as somebody who, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be able to, you know, take a private flying lesson. And I mean, it's, I can vouch as soon as you step into those, those planes, number one, you're putting headphones on so you can actually hear the person sitting next to you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and so you can hear the radio when you're contacting uh, flight, uh, the tower. 
you know, you cannot hear anything else. My my fiance was sitting directly behind me and without my headphones on or, or without her talking into the mic, had no clue what she was saying. You know, and whereas we we maintain a significant amount of situational awareness, you know, that they think that by putting on goggles that, you know, I agree that our senses are dulled and that's just not the case. You know, yes, we're looking at analog video feed. No, it's not as high def as the human eye, but we have our other four senses that can be utilized to maintain safety. So, yeah, um, exactly. You can hear somebody walking up behind you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's not like you're not aware of what's happening. You don't go deaf and no. So, at any rate, um, it's kind of went different places and that's perfectly okay. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. I don't want to keep everybody's evening uh, longer than they need to be. Um, and any last comments by anybody? I do want to see if uh, Bruce being here, if he's got Absolutely. anything special for us or if he wants to give us a sneak peek of his plans for getting the world's media on our side, uh, that would be great to hear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will be rolling out a video hopefully in the next few days, but basically what I think we have to do is come up with something that's going to attract the media's attention in a very positive way to negate some of the damage they've done. And the only way we can do that is to get, well, the only way we can get the media on side is to provide them with what they want, which is a story that's going to attract readers, going to put advertisers, messages in front of eyeballs. That's why they publish all the sensationalist panic hysteria that they publish now, because it's a business and they've got to get eyeballs on ads. We need to provide them with the same ability to get eyeballs on ads. We also have a problem that we are losing the fight for the hearts and minds of the public, because the reason that politicians and regulators can get away with all these ridiculous regulations is because the hobby has gone from one of you know uh, where you sort of see young children with toy planes in the in the long grass in the summer and it's all friendly family friendly and outdoors and healthy and educational we've lost that connection to the public we're going to regain that so i've got a initiative which i'm going to start rolling out which will hopefully my goal is to get the public on side via the media and through that we get far more effective uh, regulation and we get the politicians betting for us and we've got to work in with STEM and STEAM and all the other things we've got out there and one of the things that has to be done on a global basis it's no good just doing it in one country or one town or whatever and so what I'm looking at is initiating a global push to, re to basically win back the skies for and I'm going to call it um, uh, model aviation I'm not going to call it model aircraft I'm not going to call it drones model aviation because we don't there's this, a divide coming up here we have um, the model airplane community, oh, drones are terrible, you know, in the drone, you know, the drone community, oh, we don't want these model fixed wing flyers because they won't let us fly at their fields. We have to work together as the model aviation community and unify because it, the more we're divided, the less strength we've got in dealing with the media and the public and the regulators. So I'm sort of working on an overall picture that now there's no global umbrella organization to coordinate the actions of various groups around the world. So I'm just going to put my hand up and say, look, I'm not a global body, but on this one occasion, I'm prepared to step up to the plate and coordinate something that will basically be a global event that will be very attractive to the media. Therefore, it'll get reported to the public and it will paint a really rosy picture of our hobby, what we're doing and tone down all the talks of risk and hysteria and you know airliners and crap like that. We just need to paint a really nice picture through the media to the public, get the public engaged and start turning the whole thing around because for far too long we've been basically victims of the media. I guess turn that around. Yes. I've, I've spent many years in the media back at the turn of the century. Jeez, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> so I, I understand what makes the I understand what, what the, makes the media work. I understand what they're looking for. I understand what how we can wrap this up and present it to them in a way that they cannot resist it because it's going to be money in the bank for them. So that's what I'm working on now. And until I get sort of a little more of the, the, the groundwork done, what I'm going to be trying to do is, is talk to groups like the um, FPV Freedom Coalition and the AMA and the British Model Flying Association, all these bodies that represent model flies, and try and get them all singing from the same hymn sheet, coordinate the activities of all these groups on one day, which will be the Global Model Aviation Day, 
and we can go out there and we can just present the hobby to the public in such a positive way that we, we regain their hearts and minds and the media get sidelined with all this talk of hysteria. So that's my goal and the plan is underway. When I've got it all fleshed out, I'll do a video and, and introduce the concept and then get some feedback, see whether this is going to fly because it requires everyone in all the communities to become part of this for it to work. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And Bruce, we've uh, this is Dave Messina. We've uh, reached out, uh, made contact with the AMA here in the States and uh, have agreement with their government relations group to uh, work together and to, to stay in touch. And uh, I'm not sure if you have a, a good contact yet uh, in the AMA, uh, but if you don't, happy to introduce you to uh, Tyler Dodds. That'd be great because I'm sort of, that's the next step is to contact and that's why I've come on, on this uh, chat today to basically introduce the concept and get some feedback as to you know if the FPV Freedom Coalition is interested in becoming part of this. And as absolutely. I said, we're going to all the other groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. One, one thought I have on that is uh, at least um, around here, the the media puts us anything dealing with children and kids in the uh, that gets published. Um, so, you know, maybe we just have to put a little alert out to all the members and, and hey, contact all your local STEM clubs, all your youth programs, um, you know, whoops, whatever it is, um, so that we can, you know, present that to the media as well as part of the initiative. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, got to get it, we've got to get it there in public. We've got to get a lot of young people involved and show them that, you know, this is an educational learning thing and it gets them away from their PlayStations and out into the real world, which is... Yeah, I'd really like to see this more in schools. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it would be great. All right. Yeah, in schools... I think we're we're losing him. Yeah, and he's gone. Him. He dropped. He's gone. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, sorry, I, I dropped out there. But as far as schools and that go, there's a bit of a thing. Do we do it on a, on a weekend or do we do it on a weekday? Because on a weekend, we can invite everyone down to the park and have spare goggles and, and whatever, show people what's going on and make it a real community type of thing and, and get the kids involved at that level. Um, we can only do that really on a weekend. And I want to have one of the goals to make this newsworthy is, for example, we want to have the most um, model aviation craft in the air at any single time in the history of the planet, which means we all fly at the same time around the globe. Some of us, some of us in New Zealand have to fly at, at, at midnight, but the rest <laughs> of you will have more appropriate times. But if we can say, you know, we, we've had hundreds of thousands of drones and radio control model aircraft in oh, the air Bruce, I think we might get some fail safes here. <laughs> and, not, and not one person has died. <laughs> not one airliner has been downed. You know, we need to prove our claims that this is safe. But we take a bit of a risk because if someone does kill somebody, it doesn't work in our favour. But I'm pretty sure we can do it safely. And then uh, we can, you, know, sure. you know, we've got to do this. And that's that is the biggest event in the history of the hobby. And if we can make that happen, we're going to capture the media. The media are going to go, wow, look at this. You know, um, and if we, you know, we need to get some figures back. We can extrapolate and say, look, there were probably a quarter of a million. Um, models of any kind, and we'll encourage kids to make paper planes and throw them at this time of the day, and everyone will throw something in the air, and hopefully no one will get killed. Love it. I love the idea. All right. Um, Bruce, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we do uh, always look forward to your comments on our videos, and we do appreciate them. You've given us some great ideas and definitely some food for thought over the last several months, and uh, um we do appreciate that, and uh, it's good to have you uh, chime in. Um, you're welcome here anytime you want, and uh, love to have you. Thanks, so, guys. I'll be keeping an eye on you. <laughs> <laughs> I expect you to. Um, and uh, with that, guys, thank you for joining. Uh, I do appreciate all the feedback tonight. Um, keep a look on the Facebook page, and I will be posting the next meeting. It won't be next week. Um, but like I said but at the beginning, we're going to kind of space these out a little bit, see if we can't uh, garner a little bit larger attendance. So um, with that, I thank you, and I hope you all have a great evening. And um, kind of the middle of the week, but if you're doing flying this weekend, uh, have a great weekend. You too. You too. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Take Take care. Care. Later. Take care. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye.